I learned a lot about business because I was dealing with different kinds of businesses. And I started to notice that they all had a lot in common. You know, when you just work in one business, you have a tendency to think that the principles that apply to your business are specific to your business, but they're actually applicable in many other areas. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of In the Den. Today, I am joined by Michael Houlihan. Michael is founder of Barefoot Wine. He is also the author of Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built America's Number One Wine Brand, and founder of Business Audio Theater. Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself and Barefoot Wine. Well, first off, welcome. Welcome to the den. (laughs) Nice to be here, CJ. And if you don't mind just sharing with our audience who may not know, um, you know, who and what is Barefoot Wine? Well, you know, I started off in San Francisco. I was born up in Pacific Heights, and uh, I'm one of the few native San Franciscans left in that town uh, and don't live very far from it. I'm a naturalist as a result of being a native Californian, having seen the state developed my whole life. You know, I'm kind of like, please stop it now, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, when we did Barefoot Wine, we were able to support a lot of conservation groups uh, as a form of advertising, actually, to get the word out about our products. Uh, So we didn't have to give up. And Bonnie is from Portland, Oregon. She came down here from Portland for the same reason I came up here. We both wanted to get away from the cities because they were getting like infilled and we wanted to get back to the country. So we moved to the country and we met here. And so we're both urban refugees. And uh, so, so that explains a little bit about why we're tree huggers and uh, <laughs> why, why we're conservation minded. But we took that idea into our business and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, and I, I know that you had mentioned about you know being urban refugees, and I kind of did things a little bit backwards. So I grew up in Central Florida in the South. I grew up on farms, the middle of nowhere, one stoplight in the town. Uh, I, you know, when I was a young child, and I decided to make a move to Philadelphia. Don't don't ask me why. The short answer is I followed the money, right? <laughs> and uh, and then I very quickly realized I'm not a city girl, and I live in the suburbs. But throughout my career, there have been quite a few struggles that really led me to where I'm at. What are some of the struggles that you faced throughout making that transition and starting Barefoot Wine? Well, one of the biggest uh, struggles that I faced was, you know, you get onto this track where, you, you know, you go to high school and then you go to college and then they want you to declare your major and then you graduate and you want to get a job and then you get a job uh, and then it's like, five or six years go by before you realize that you're really not happy, uh, that this this is not consistent with what you want to do with your life. Uh, but you're making so much money that you think, well, you know, maybe I should just suck it up or maybe I'll just do it for a few more years. And so uh, th- that's that's the problem that I faced, which was that I was very successful in the corporate world actually in the in the government world as well. And I was making too much money to quit, you know, uh, too much security, you know, the retirement, all that stuff. Um, so I ultimately had to come to grips with myself and just say, you know, you're not happy here, uh, Hulahan. Uh, you you want to do something else. And so I, I quit, but I didn't even have a job. And my Irish grandmother said, how could you leave that fine civil service job with all that security, Michael? You know, and it's like, I'm sorry, Grandma, but, you know, I couldn't really wait for my boss to die just to get a raise. Right. You know, it's like once you get into the system, you're in the system. And uh, that wasn't for me. So I became an entrepreneur uh, and I, I did a, a couple of different businesses. Uh, some were successful, some failed. Uh, but I learned a lot about what was necessary. And I also realized that I was living on a lot less because when you're an entrepreneur, you're working for like $6 an hour, you know, uh, for the first few years. If that, if that, okay, because everything is going back into the business. Yeah. And so, that was also difficult. Um, but I had enough 
experience working for the federal government that people started to hire me just to get things done with the federal government because there was such a big bureaucracy and it would move at the speed of mud. And so I would help them expedite things. You know, if they wanted to say, uh, divide property, I would help them get through the county government. If they wanted to do a zoning thing, I'd help them get through the city government. If they wanted to get money from the, uh, from the SBA, I'd help them get through the federal government. And so uh, it, it's because I wasn't afraid of the bureaucrats because I was one of them, see? And I knew exactly how they thought and I knew what was necessary to move things along. So that's how I got into consulting because I started to have a consulting practice where uh, businesses were coming to me to get things done, mostly with the government. Um, in the process of all that, I learned a lot about business because I was dealing with different kinds of businesses. And I started to notice that they all had a lot in common. You know, when you just work in one business, you have a tendency to think that the principles that apply to your business are specific to your business, but they're actually applicable in many other areas. And once I realized that, I wasn't afraid to go into business myself because I had learned enough about the principles that I could take those principles with me. And uh, no matter what, at least I thought at the time, was thrown up against me, I could handle it. Uh, and I was probably maybe 40 to 50% right because there was a lot of stuff I couldn't handle. <laughs> We, listen, we see that with, you know, we interview a lot of different guests and, and it's just like you said, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. We all have the same, you know, types of strengths within our organizations, the same types of weaknesses, the same obstacles, um, you know, little pieces change here or there. But like you said, the, the core values of what makes an entrepreneur successful, it doesn't matter the industry. They are the, you know, those core values. Let's uh, switch gears back to Barefoot uh, Wine. We love Barefoot Spirit. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how E and Jay Gallo hired you and Bonnie Harvey to keep the spirit alive with the brand? Well, it was interesting. So when we sold the brand, um, they came to us and they said, you know, we'd like you to come and work for us as a brand consultant. And they used these exact words to keep the barefoot spirit alive. Now we like those words so much that our New York Times bestseller is called The Barefoot Spirit, you yeah. see? And uh, we've now got an audio book out called The Barefoot Spirit. And it's really, it was really interesting that they should frame it like that because they knew that they were buying an entrepreneurial business that had a lot of fire and spark and a uniqueness. And they knew that their own business was a big company. And, you know, when companies get big, they tend to go after efficiencies of scale and they tend to want to standardize things. And as a result, it, it starts to get a kind of a corporate look. You know, you can tell when a product has been acquired by a big company because it begins to lose its, its flavor, its spice. You know, it, it just the way it looks on the shelf starts to dull down. It becomes a label. It isn't a brand anymore. It's a label. And so they didn't want that to happen. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you, I have nothing but respect for them. Uh, and so, yeah, we worked for them for a year or so, and we helped them keep the barefoot spirit alive. And it was interesting for us because we were entrepreneurs and, you know, yes, we both worked in corporate cultures before, but to actually try to get a, a, an entrepreneurial spirit alive, keep it alive and inflamed in a corporate world was a challenge because, because you have to remember when you work in a big corporation, job security is job number one, see? And, a, and, a, and, and when you're working as an entrepreneur, the customer satisfaction in sales is job number one. Yeah. So and when you work for a big company, your particular skill set, whether you're an engineer or a software person or whatever you do, an accountant, you know, a manager, you belong to a, a group of managers. You know, you get their periodical, you're, you're part of their website. You know, you know what other people in your profession make. See, and you use that to negotiate your salary. 
See, that's how corporations operate. In other words, it's a pretty strict division of labor. And when you have divisions of labor, you automatically get cells. You, you automatically get silos. And now it becomes more difficult for information to move between those cellular walls. And so for us, it was starting over and, you know, basically bringing him back to the idea that Barefoot was a brand that had a purpose and uh, a style. And yes, it had a product to go with it, but it wasn't the product. It was the style. It was, you know, the promise, you know, those are the kinds of things that entrepreneurs bring to the table. It's hard for corporations to do that because their labor is all specialists and entrepreneurs are more generalists. I mean, it's not unheard of that the winemaker has to also be the personnel manager or also has to help design the ads you know, for the wines or what have you. Uh, in any small business starting out, you know, you everybody wears all the hats. You know, it's the only way to survive. You know, there's yeah. there's too many demands and there's there's not enough skills. So that was that was a big challenge. Yeah, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about the spirit, but before we do, I want to I want to hone in on something you said, and I want to make sure the audience didn't miss that, and that is that um, you know the difference between an entrepreneurial business and a corporation. And that is that you're, when you are a, an entrepreneur or a small business, your sales and your customers are number one. And I think that the sad reality is, is when a business does get large and turns into a corporation that they forget that. And that's where people start to feel like a number or they feel like robots and it's just, you know, stepping on other people's toes. And, and there's just a lot of chaos in there. But businesses cannot succeed without sales and without that customer service. So I just want to say to any of our listeners that are, are listening in on that, that is something super important that Michael said. Your sales department and your customer service should be your number one thought. The first thing you think about and the major uh, where where you put your attention, your major point of attention needs to be on those two things. Um, so I just wanted to hone in on that, Michael, because I could not agree with you more. And that's something that we preach on a regular basis here to our employees is helping them understand why we look at customer service as our, you know, our number one, our clients are number one. If you could can the barefoot spirit and pour it out on the table, um, you know, tell people what does that look like? What is the barefoot spirit? Well, it's the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, kind of West coast style. Okay. So with no dispersions on the East coast, the West Coast is more freewheeling, accepting, willing to try and experiment new ideas, uh, less likely to take no for an answer. Uh, you know, people in the West, if they get told no, they ask a different day, a different way, or a different person. Right. <laughs> they, because they know that the only person that can say no is themselves when they quit. So that's spirit. They say that team has spirit. Or, you know, uh, that's the spirit. We use the word spirit to really describe an attitude, uh, which, which is, uh, are you unsinkable? You know, uh, are you positive? Uh, you know, uh, optimistic, uh, inclusive, those kinds of, uh, of uh, adjectives. But I really think that what the spirit really boils down to is, resourcefulness. In other words, even if you don't have the money, you get the job done. Right. Even Looking if forward. the guy, yeah, even if the guy you depend on doesn't do the job, you do the job right. for the guy. In other words, you know that you have to provide for your customer or you're, you're not going to get paid, period. You know, the customer's the boss. Because you know that. You get off your high horse pretty fast get down in the trenches pretty fast, do whatever you have to do, put the plugs together to keep the show on the road. And that is the barefoot spirit. It's that we can do this. Another part of the barefoot spirit is the inclusiveness of problem solving. So 
in the big companies, it's more like need to know. You know, if it's a marketing problem, marketing handles it. If it's a sales problem, sales handles it. Engineering problem, engineering handles it. Okay. But the barefoot spirit is more like um, we've got a problem uh, in the stores uh, and uh, we're going to throw it out for everybody and we're going to see, you know, what kind of ideas come out of you. So it's brainstorming with your own people. And of course, if one of your own people comes up with a brilliant solution, and we've had lots of them, uh, you, you thank them, you acknowledge them publicly, and then everybody knows who did it, why, who they are, respects them more, and it builds team spirit. Again, back to the spirit. Right. So you can't have spirit unless you have team spirit, and you can't have team spirit unless top management acknowledges every player. So it sounds to me that it's really just about having a positive av- attitude and keeping the, the ship moving forward, right? Not letting um, obstacles or difficulties standing the way, just really figuring out how do we accomplish this? You know that the answer is yes, you have to accomplish it. It's just figuring out the, the who and how and, and why. Um, and, the, and that you have the team that can do it. You don't yeah. have to do it all yourself. Your team can, can do it, but you have right. to ask your team for help. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're you're no stranger to, um, you know, keeping that spirit for yourself, too. After Barefoot Wine, um, you started uh, the Business Audio Theater, which is revolutionizing how brands tell their stories. Can you tell me a little bit more about that transition from wine to Hollywood? <laughs> well, you know, we say in California, we have three things. We got wine, we got Hollywood, and we got software. So we put them all together, Okay. So what we're doing is we're producing MP3s, okay, basically audio books, uh, and we're doing it in a 1945 radio theater style. You know, like a long time ago before television, they would have radio theater with actors and actresses and, you know, music and sound effects. And, you know, it was emotional and the movie was going on in your head. It wasn't going on on the screen and you were listening to it. you know, now we have a, a, a big breakthrough in audio. I mean, uh, podcasts are taking off, as you know. Uh, audio books are taking off, as you know. Most people 24 to 45 years old prefer to get their information through their ears, and, and they want to give their eyes a rest. They're spending too much time on the screen already. And they like the idea of being mobile, and, and they like the idea of being on demand. So... We took a look at this. We wrote our book, The Barefoot Spirit. Uh, and uh, like when we wrote the book, we, we bought about five or six of the top selling uh, uh, business audio books in the country. And we, and we read them. And they were all they were all good. But I mean, it, they were very they were very prescriptive. You know, like here's the three things you got to do, the five things you never do, and the 20 things your customer wants from you. Well, I'm sorry. I fell asleep on number three. OK, <laughs> so then that became a bestseller. We went on a speaking tour and we noticed about six years ago, all the, everybody was coming in with earbuds. I mean, it was just like overnight, everybody was on, on earbuds. And so we said, well, what are you listening to? Is it hip hop? Is it rock and roll? What is it? And a guy would say, no, no, I'm listening to a podcast on how to improve my business. But the other lady said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening to war and peace. I always wanted to read it, but I can't sit still for that. And so we looked at each other and we went, this is where it's going. This is really interesting. We could get to a whole new audience if we had an audio book. So then we did the same thing. We bought the top 10 audio books, business audio books from Amazon. We listened to them. They were all great. We learned something from everyone, but they were all kind of read to you either by the author or by some narrator. And God help you if you got a narrator you didn't like, you were with them for seven hours. Yeah. So, so we said, you know, this is one day we're driving across the Nevada desert and here comes Prairie Home Companion PBS. And uh, it's uh, it's this show called uh, Guy Noir Private Eye. And it's a spoof on a 1945 radio show. You know, I knew she was trouble when she walked in the door, you know, that kind of thing. And we were listening to it. We were thinking, this is a great medium, you know, to communicate business ideas through drama. Not, not, through, not through lecture, but through drama. You don't tell people in the first person, you tell people in the third person, right? So we decided to do that and we put the word out. We made friends with some folks in Hollywood uh, 
uh, that that have uh, uh, Sherwood uh, Players Productions in Hollywood. They they have created a lot of movies and a lot of uh, commercials for people and whatnot. And so they produced our book, The Barefoot Spirit. And uh, we're happy to say it was one of the top five business audiobooks of 2020. And the judge said, you know why we awarded it this? Because we've never heard a business audiobook done this way before. So we knew that we were onto something and we said, well, maybe some other founders would like to use this media. So then we started doing it for other founders and they're using it to attract, uh, engage and retain their people. So they just basically give it away for free. They say, here's our story. Listen to it as you want to. Maybe it's three hours long at six segments and you can listen to their story. And now you know that the guy wasn't born with a spoon in his mouth or that the gal didn't come from a rich family. You know that they worked very hard to get where they are. And I absolutely you, love that idea. That's well, there you go. So mm -hmm. the, the idea is if you can break down to the point where you're a real human being, then people are going to identify with you and they're going to pull for you. And if they identify and pull for you, they're going to be more likely to want to work for you. If they're working for you, they're going to be more likely to want to stay. And if they're staying, they're going to be more likely to want to contribute because they know who you are, see? And they, they know what your values are, which is really important. So that's the thing we're into right now. We're really excited about it. Uh, we're in, our, we're in a production right now that is going to be fabulous. It's the first commercial use of telemedicine. That's awesome. And, yeah. It starts with this doctor who has this concept. Right. But he's up against all kinds of problems. Like the internet's been invented, but they don't have broadband yet. Yeah. You know, so he has all these technical problems, but because he's first to the gate, he's, he's the odds on favorite when the gate opens. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. And I, I want to you had mentioned about retention. I want us to talk a little bit about um, retention. But before we do that, I wanted to to share something because I am all about empowering people to to better themselves. And several years ago, I was kind of getting down on myself because I I'm an avid reader. I love to read. I always have. But when you're in business and you are in leadership or management, you, you've got a million things going. And unfortunately, the first thing that typically slips is, is your personal life. And I needed to figure out time is the one thing we can't have more of, right? So I went through this process of trying to figure out, okay, these are all the things that I would like to be able to accomplish throughout the day. And reading is one of them. Um, I switched over to audiobooks. I've always been a fan of a paper book in my hand. Um, I take Kindles when I travel, but I wasn't able to devote that kind of time. And it was really making me feel bad about myself. So I switched over to audiobooks. And still to this day, almost every single day when I'm driving to work, I have a 45 minute commute. I have an audiobook that is, is playing. Um, and I can usually get through about one book a week, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on phone calls and things like that. But it has honestly, I figured out a way to make it happen. So I guess that's what I'm trying to say to the audience out there. And what Michael Michael is sharing is it is super important for us to be able to, to learn and grow and advance ourselves. But don't let excuses keep you from being able to do that because technology has allowed us so many advancements and audiobooks, podcasts, and things like that are just one of those things that can still allow us to achieve our goals, feed our souls, feed our minds, and move forward. So I really appreciate that. And I definitely support that. That's a great way to put it. You know, I used to look forward to long trips in the car because I, I, I thought, oh, I get to listen to this book, you know. Yep. But Absolutely. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the retention. So the New York Times has talked about, a lot about the great resignation. And you had mentioned about the barefoot spirit. Can you share some information with business owners on how barefoot is using that spirit to help retain and kind of prevent employees? From leaving. Okay, so so there's a lot of reasons why we've had this great resignation. Uh, but one thing's for sure, people have been cloistered for two years with COVID. They've had a chance to be around their families. They've had a chance to think about their lives. They, they have also had a chance to save maybe two hours worth of commute time a day. And so now they're saying, oh, do I really want to go back to that job? Or they're saying, well, the job is now home and it's on the computer. 
So now it's on the computer. I wonder what else I could do on the computer. You know, I don't really like this job. Maybe I, since I am working on a computer now, why don't I work on a computer from home? I can still be around my kids, but I can now work for a company that I can identify with, see? So it's not just the kids at home, it's what is the kid's life gonna be like in 10 years, in 20 years, you know? What's gonna happen with the environment? You know, what's going to happen with peace? What's going to happen with opportunity, with inclusion? All these issues that we face today, they're coming to a head right now. We're living in these tumultuous times. And you have to, as a parent, you have to start thinking about what it means to your kids. And once parents start thinking about that, they're going, well, I'm just a hypocrite working for this company because I know where they're getting their supplies and I know how they treat their people. And I don't really want to work for this company anymore. So that's what is driving to a large part. Now, it's not the only reason, but it's to a large part, it's, it's responsible for the big uptick in resignations. So you've got the COVID, people at home thinking it over, coming back to work, thinking it over. And, you know, they slow down enough. They're going, wait a minute, you know, maybe this isn't right for me. And so what we would like to do is, is offer this idea that companies need to be really transparent about who they are, how they treat people, how they source their products, what their sales programs are, et cetera, uh, inclusion, all that stuff, or they're going to lose their people. Right. See, because young people today who are 25 to 45, what are they? They're parents. Okay. Parents have a responsibility to their children. That responsibility has to do with how the planet and everything else looks in 20 years. Right. They don't want to make their money doing something that's going to be negative on their kid. Because their kid's going to turn around and say, hey, dad, didn't you know this was going to happen? Right. See? And so, I mean, yes, everybody needs money. There's no question. But the bottom line is, ultimately, you have to be able to face down your own kid in 20 years and say, look, uh, Junior, I did the best job I could do. Yeah. You know, but that's what I think is going on right now. I think that that's the biggest change that we see in the workplace is turnover and turnover is expensive. You don't just lose the person, you lose the training. You don't just lose the training, you lose the relationships. That person's working for you. They made friends in another company that always puts you first. Boom, Mary's gone. And so now Billy's in the job. They don't know Billy. So yeah. things take longer. Yeah, so, absolutely. So this is this is a real, a real financial consideration today, turnover. Yeah. I do think um that the pandemic definitely had a lot to do with it. Like you said, people had a lot more time on their hands to think. Um, they had a lot more time with their, their family. They had a lot more time to really measure up and kind of see where they were in their life and where they wanted to be. I think that the downside to, to where it sits right now is organizations like us, we deal with small to medium-sized business owners, right? Right now, we're still at a hybrid model. We have our employees that are required to come in three days a week. Um, there's quite a few of us who are here every day. I am not a work-from-home person. I cannot do it. I am not good at it. I try to be too productive and then it becomes counterproductive because I am washing baseboards and doing laundry in between conference calls. I'm just, I wasn't built for that. I am a people person. I need to see people. I feed off of them. And we're in an organization that that's important. So I would hope that as things start to level out and we are getting to that post-pandemic stage, that people really start to think about that too from the business standpoint and the companies that they're working with and how important it is for that collaboration. So there are definitely some positions that working remotely are perfectly fine, but then there's also the need for that collaboration that you can't get via Zoom. Yeah, we can have this conversation, but reading body language or just turning around and asking someone, hey, what do you think about this? We are losing so much education and creativity that's learned from people that I actually start to worry about how that is going to affect our children. I have a 19-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter, and I see already drastic differences from, you know, both of them at the stages that they're at. So I, I just hope that we kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. So I, I agree with you 100%. There's no question that in-person is much better than anything that is virtual. Uh, but 
what is driving turnover now, I think, is the work from home thing. Yeah. I, I, I think that you have people who don't want to go back to work because it's more convenient for them. Yeah. But I do think that if you really want to attract, engage, uh, and retain people in the physical workplace, they also have to know that they are making a difference. Yep. They're not just making a paycheck, they're making a difference, which means that now the company has to stand for more than their goods and services. Yep. And, and those, those are the kinds of things that I see happening in the workplace itself, in the physical workplace. So it's, it's not enough just to be you know, in your silo. Now you have to say, what is this organization's purpose, right? Yep. You know, is this, is this organization doing something that is for the benefit of the community? And, and so, yes. I, I could agree. not, you're, so many nuggets of wisdom there, but the one thing that you said hit it on the, on the head. It truly is, it's about convenience. We can chop it up into any pieces that we want, but really at the end of the day, people got very comfortable um, during the pandemic with the work from home capabilities and a lot of the frustration. Some are definitely concerned for about their health and their well-being, but a large majority, it is about convenience. So I agree with you that it is the employer's responsibility to showcase what are the values of the company? What do we stand for? What are we here for? Why are we doing this day in and day out? And if the answer is the bottom line, then of course people aren't going to want to take their time to, to come in. Um, and the customer centric avenue and helping people understand the clients that you serve and the value behind that is definitely way more appealing for those who are willing to, to come into the office. Amen to that. Yeah. So let's let's talk about marketing since I kind of threw one SEO in and we're talking a little bit about that. You have some experience with a unique form of advertising and it's called cause marketing. Can you talk about how this is effective for startups and entrepreneurs and help spread the word about to help spread the word about their products and services? Okay, so probably the biggest problem that entrepreneurs face is how do I scale? How do I get the word out about my product or my services so that there's enough sales that it does scale? So we're really talking about advertising now. We're talking about getting the word out. Now, we were in a situation where we didn't have enough money and the chain stores wouldn't take us because they wanted us to spend $2 million on advertising. However, one day I get a call from a, a, a business leader in Chinatown who is raising money for a kid's after school park in his neighborhood. And he wanted $50,000 from me, which I thought was pretty funny because I wish I had $50,000 at that point in my career. It was very humble. You know, you could break us like a matchstick. And um, I said, look, I, I, don't, I don't have any money, but I really like your idea. Uh, I like keeping the kids off the street after school. That's a great idea. I'll tell you what, I will give you wine. I will donate it to you. You can use it at your fundraiser, maybe to loosen some people up and then maybe they'll write a bigger check or maybe they can auction it off and you can, you know, use the money for slides and swings in a sandbox or whatever. Well, he wasn't real happy with that, but he took the wine. A couple of weeks later, sales started taking off in the Chinatown neighborhood in San Francisco. And we looked at each other and we went, wow, you know, we're, we're, we're dying trying in these other stores, but look at Chinatown. What is that? And we went, oh, isn't that where we donated the wine? Yes, it was. Oh, maybe the people who went to that fundraiser remembered our label and went out and bought it. And maybe they had a social reason to buy it, which is different than, an, uh, than uh, a mercantile reason. Mercantile reason goes like this. It's the best price. It's the best quality. Those are mercantile reasons. Okay, here, here, here's the social reason. They helped us with our fundraising drive. They helped us get our word out about what we're doing. Yep. So we thought if this worked here, let's try it in another neighborhood. So we tried it in Pacific Heights, a very tony neighborhood of San Francisco. They were trying to clean up a, a creek. It had pollution. They cleaned it up. We gave, them the, we gave them the wine for their fundraiser. Same thing happened there. We thought, wow, maybe we've discovered something. So we went to Southern California. We supported the Surfriders Association down there, foundation. And then we went to different parts of the country and supported different groups uh, that were conservation-minded groups in different parts of the country. 
And the members of those nonprofit organizations now had a social reason to buy our product. It wasn't a mercantile reason. They not only were buying our product, but they were telling their friends and neighbors about it too. So we took customers and turned them into advocates. So that's how Barefoot grew across the country. And even when we were, when we were uh, doing really well and we had a big budget, we did not put the money into commercial advertising. We always put it into what we call worthy cause marketing. Now there's a difference between cause marketing and worthy cause marketing. Cause marketing, you got the pink ribbon, you know, uh, we're supporting the American Cancer Society, buy my product because I'm such a good guy, can't you see by my badge? Okay, that's cause marketing. Now, and by the way, we need those people. A <laughs> lot of great causes are supported by them. Now. Worthy cause marketing, it doesn't have to do with the general public. It has to do with you supporting a group and that the and and hopefully marketing your product to the members of that group. They're already organized. They already have a newsletter. They already meet on a regular basis. They already have a website. And the way that you can help them is you can take their goals and you can use their goals on your marketing materials. And you can help them raise funds by advertising their events on your products or, or, or through your services. So the idea here is it's not about bragging. It's more about helping. And it's not about writing a check. It's about getting the word out about their goals. Because you have access, we did, had access to something they didn't. We had access to an audience, which was the supermarket shopper. Right. They could not get to her. She was a 37 year old mom with two kids. They could not get to her, but we could get to her. And so we got to her with their goals and the problems that they solved. And then she in turn supported them. So if you're starting a business, you want to think about what is my goods and services? And now what nonprofit organizations can I marry that do sort of like what I'm doing. Like if I'm selling fishing gear, fishing poles, maybe I should be supporting Wild Rivers or the Salmon Council, see? Um, you know, if I am, uh, you know, I don't want to leave any of our redneck friends out, but let's, let's, let's say you're, you're, uh, we have a friend who actually uh, is selling gun safety classes, okay? So you don't have an accident. Um, and he, decided to support the PTAs, the police association, the sheriff's association, the highway patrol associations. And he was helping them get the word out about what they do and offering his classes as an auction item in their fundraisers. Yep. And then he would go to their fundraisers and explain to them why he supported them and what he was doing. So, and that, and that was his whole form of advertising. And he was booked solid with his classes. So it isn't just wine, it could be anything. There's, there's a disparate amount of extreme there between gun safety and wine. Uh, but those extremes were both supported by worthy cause marketing. I think that it's it's absolutely phenomenal if you really kind of think about that because we think there's so many different events that happen and you're at an event and they're serving you food or wine or they have raffle baskets and things like that. There, it's, it's a huge opportunity to get those goods and services out there. And then it's just like word of mouth. And, but not only do they get to say, hey, listen, I had this wine. It's amazing. You should, you know, you should try it. They're also married to that wine because they feel that that wine supported us the same cause that they are supporting of. So I, I think that it's, it's a per worthy cause marketing is a perfect way to marry goods and services with what we as humans need to see our businesses moving towards. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be done the same way that you said, but a company needs to stand for something and your employees need to understand what do we support and how are we supporting them? Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. we have a ton of food sitting here right now because we're uh, we're collecting food for um, a food bank. Uh, that's local. And we're made it a contest for our team. And we send out reminders almost every day telling them where they sit. And we're trying to make it fun and engaging. But at the end of the day, they know that we're doing this 
to support this local cause. And that's something that businesses can do. And by us doing that, people in the community see us as a digital marketing agency participating. And if they ever need our services, guess what? Now we're in bed with something that they are also in bed with. And that makes a, that makes a world of difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the thing, the thing that a lot of people do is they will donate their goods and services to a worthy cause and expect sales to take off. What you have to do is you've got to manage that donation. Like for instance, don't make your goods and services become a commodity. Make sure it's a brand. So for instance, make sure that you're doing it at the, at the fundraising dinner you know, where you have a male and a female or two males or two females, but they're couples and they're going to this, they have some expendable cash because they're donating and they're paying $200 a plate for this dinner. Those are your customers right there. We've just talked about your customers. Those are people who are in decision-making capacities in their companies. They have the funds, see? So you want to make sure that your products and services are not only being used, but they're being showcased. And that's why you have to do things like you, you're going to write in their blog. You've got to show up at their fundraisers and ask to speak. Uh, you have to ask to be publicly thanked from the podium. You maybe put up a banner at their fundraisers so they know it. But it, it's like you say, CJ, you know, it's, it's like how many, how many times is your name out there? until finally they need your services and they go, oh yeah, I know that person. I'll, I'll, I'll go with, you know, one SEO. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it ties in. And also it, I, I love the, this conversation because we talked about several different things and they all really just kind of intertwine with one another. Um, and if we go back to our conversation about the, the great resignation and kind of what leads up to that, companies having a purpose, having a passion and doing more than just the goods and services that they, that they sell, that's what people need to see. That's what the community requires. That's what employees are looking for when they look to stay long term. So I think we kind of, you know, I think we we hit all of those facets all within the same, you know, 20 minute loop here, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Huh? Not bad. It's amazing how things work together, right? Yeah. Not bad for a linear male. Huh? There you go. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming in the den with me today. Um, again, um, Michael with Barefoot Wine, we are so thankful to have some of the insight and understand a little bit more about the culture and the spirit behind Barefoot and your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us and hopefully we'll get to have you on again soon. It's a pleasure, CJ. Thank you. Thank you so much.